I'm on a mission from God. And no, this is not talking about the Blues Brothers putting the band back together, okay? I'm talking about Moses. All right, Moses, in one of the coolest examples of someone who is on a mission from God, the account in the book of Exodus when God gives Moses a job to do, to go back to Egypt, to let his people go. It's a fascinating story from scripture. So let's just review quickly in our minds some of the details of this incredible account of, of this mission that God gives to one man, Moses. First of all, we have Moses, right? He's born during a traumatic time for the Israelite people when they are slaves in Egypt, right? The baby boys were supposed to be killed, so Moses' parents hide him in a basket in the river, and who finds Moses? But the Pharaoh's daughter, she finds him, and Moses, this Hebrew slave, ends up growing up as a prince in Egypt. But at the age of 40, this prince of Egypt, seeing his people being abused and, and, and just enduring all of this hardship, he just snaps and he murders one of the Egyptians that is abusing one of his Hebrew kinsmen. And Moses has to flee Egypt out to the middle of nowhere in the wilderness. And for the next 40 years, he has to live there. He lives there in, in his own voluntary exile to escape um, the Pharaoh. But then while he's there, Exodus chapter three, you know this account, Moses at the burning bush where God speaks to Moses. He introduces himself to Moses with a name that is to be used for God. From this point forward, the name Yahweh, the personal name for God. And he says, Moses, this is who I am and this is what I'm calling you to do, to go to the people, to go back to the Pharaoh, to tell him to let my people go. So Moses does. After a lot of dialogue of God sends somebody else, there's this back and forth that happens. But finally Moses says, yes, he's obedient and he goes. And in Exodus chapter five, Moses goes before Pharaoh, right? He's got this mission from God. God tells him to go. Moses goes in and he tells the Pharaoh, hey, God, Yahweh wants, to, wants you to let his people go. And the Pharaoh obviously lets them go, right? No. In fact, here's what he does. He makes the work harder on the Hebrew slaves, right? He banishes Moses. He goes, get out of my sight. He makes the work harder. So not only is the Pharaoh mad, not only did Moses fail in what God had told him to do, but now the Hebrew people themselves are angry with Moses. And they're like, what are you doing? You just made the work harder for us, right? We couldn't do it before. Now we really can't do it. And at the end of chapter five, I want you to look at Moses' conversation with God. Just check this out at the end of, of chapter five. Moses, he's afraid, right? He's discouraged. You can even hear anger in his voice. Listen to what he says. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, oh Lord, why have you done this evil to your people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses is in this moment of crisis and he's questioning God. But God responds in chapter six and what an answer he gives. In, in a nutshell, he says, listen, Moses, I'm about to do something so incredible, so so magnificent. I'm about to do something that just is far beyond anything you could have dreamed. Moses, you need to trust me that I am at work. And I want you to follow along as we read the first eight verses of Exodus chapter six to look at God's response to Moses. But the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. 
I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians." I'll bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. And just in case they had missed it, what is what are these last four words? Say them with me. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. What an incredible response. And do you see it? Do you see in that passage there God's answer to Moses' fears? his answer to Moses' discouragement and his doubts. He says, Moses, I want you to understand my name. And today, we're gonna look at the statements in verses six through eight in this passage. Did you notice them? There were several statements there where God said, I will, and then he said what he would do. We're gonna look at some of those this morning, but here's what I need you to understand before we dig into those statements. Everything that God says he will do is attached to his name. It's attached to who he is. You see, Moses, at the end of chapter five, he used God's name, Yahweh, but it wasn't connecting from here to here. He said the word, but he didn't understand the character of who he was addressing. And God says, listen, Moses, you've gotta understand who I am because who I am determines what I do. And Israel's gotta understand who I am because who I am determines what I will do. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 9, verse 10. He says this, and those who know your name put their trust in you. It's about his name. So you'll notice if you're following along, there are seven statements, seven I will statements in Exodus chapter six, verses six through eight. We're only gonna have time to look at four of those today, but those four statements hold incredible significance for the Hebrew people. These four I will statements that we're gonna look at today are what helped to frame the entire Passover meal that the Hebrew people would celebrate every year to remember their exodus from Egypt and how God delivered them from the hands of Pharaoh. And each of these cups have a name. And each name of the cup is attached to something that God did for them. They're attached to his name. They help us understand his character and what he is doing in in a greater way. So I want us to look at at four statements this morning out of verses six through eight of Exodus chapter six so that we can better understand him in a deeper way, just like he was calling the Israelites to do. So The first cup that I want us to look at this morning is the cup of sanctification, is how it would be known. It comes from the beginning of verse six where he says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The word sanctification means to set apart. You see, and the Israelites, they had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. They had forgotten who they were. You see, it was still true of them. They were God's chosen people. The covenant that God had made with Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12, that he would make a great nation and all the world would be blessed through Abraham's descendants, that was still true of who they were, but they weren't living like it. They, didn't, they weren't living out that identity. And God says, I'm going to bring you out. I have set you apart. And I'm gonna bring you out of Egypt and I am going to take you to the promised land. He says, I am going to do that. The faithfulness of the Lord is so clear 
from the cup of sanctification. So in the Passover meal, at the very beginning of the meal, the father would take this cup as he began to tell the story of the Exodus. And they would, they would retell this story every year to the family. And so every year when he took the cup of sanctification, he would remind his family and remind himself of the faithfulness of God, Amen. that they had been set apart that they had been called, and that God would accomplish what he said he would do. Amen. The faithfulness of God would be remembered from the cup of sanctification. But there's another cup. There's another I will statement. Look at the next one in verse six as well. He says, I will deliver you. I will deliver you from slavery to them. The second cup would be called the cup of deliverance. This cup would be drunk at the conclusion of the father retelling the story of the 10 plagues. The 10 plagues that God would have used to, to show his greatness to Pharaoh and to Egypt and to the Hebrew people to remind them of God's power and his might and his strength to deliver. The word means to rescue. It's the idea of snatching out of danger or to snatch away from an enemy. And God says, I want you to remember that I will deliver you from bondage. And as they retell that story, they're reminded, the cup of sanctification reminded them of the faithfulness of God, but the cup of deliverance reminded them of the power of God of his might, of his strength. This cup is sometimes referred to as the cup of judgment. And I want you to put this in the back of your mind. We're gonna come back to it in a few minutes. In order to deliver the Hebrews from bondage in Egypt, God's judgment, his wrath had to be poured out, and he poured it out on who? The Egyptians. File that away. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. There's a third cup attached to the next I will statement, and that is this. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. This cup would be drunk after the meal. And at this point in the narrative, in the Exodus narrative, the father would be telling the family, remember the 10th plague, that death of the firstborn where the death angel passed through and we were spared because the blood was applied to the doorpost of our home. And it was because of that that the Pharaoh let us go and God delivered us. But then we got to the Red Sea and we were trapped because Pharaoh changed his mind and he came after us. But God made a way. He parted the sea so that we could cross on dry land. And then as the Egyptian army followed us into the sea, the sea closed back on them and they went to a watery grave. As he retold that, they would drink there at the end of the meal, the cup of redemption. You see that moment. He says, I will redeem you. Did you see it? With an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. What did God use? God parted the sea, but what did, Moses, what did he tell Moses to do in order for the sea to part? To stretch out his arms. Right? What was the great act of judgment? We have one before the parting of the sea, the death of the firstborn, but then there is this paid in full moment. Right? God had delivered the people. They were at the Red Sea, but then Pharaoh came after them. There was still some danger, but then the Hebrew people crossed through. The sea closed back on the Egyptian army, and they were free. They were redeemed. The word redeemed means to buy back. So that moment where the sea closed on the Egyptians and they were on the, uh, the Hebrew people were on the other side, that was this paid in full moment where God says, I will redeem you. 
This is a beautiful picture all through the, uh, for the Hebrew people in their culture and even in their law. This word redeem actually means kinsman redeemer. If you're familiar with the story of Ruth and Boaz, Boaz was a kinsman redeemer. It's this beautiful picture of someone who steps in to help someone who can't help themselves. Someone who steps in for the vulnerable, for the weak, and, and takes care of their debt and provides for them and purchases their freedom when they were in danger of being in bondage. That's the idea of the cup of redemption, is that God was the kinsman redeemer. He is the one who redeemed his people who could not free themselves, but God freed them. Then there's a fourth cup. Look at verse seven. Verse seven says, I will take you to be my people. After the cup of redemption, before the, before the Passover meal, before the time was over, they had finished dinner, but now they were there and they would remember that God had gathered them to the promised land. This cup is called the cup of praise. It's also referred to as the Hallel cup, where we get the word hallelujah, which means praise God. Amen. They would drink this cup and they would, they would read or even sing Psalms 113 through 118. We don't have time to go there this morning, but maybe file that away, write that down and go back and read what are called the Egyptian Hallel Psalms, these psalms of praise. And I want you to think about how many times they praise God for what he has done. And look at how many times God says, I am the Lord. It weaves it all together and it connects it in such an incredible way. This cup of praise, they were praising God that the promise he made to Abraham was the promise he kept to bring them into the promised land, to that land flowing with milk and honey. So we remember the faithfulness of God. We remember the power of God. Through the cup of redemption, we see the grace and the mercy of God. And through this cup of praise, we see the loving kindness of God to gather his people. Those were the things that these cups taught them about Yahweh. When they would say that name, they would remember this is who he was. And so from the time of Moses until the time of Jesus, 1,500 years, every year, the Hebrew people would take these four cups and they would remember that story every year. Jesus himself partook of the Passover meal. All four gospels tell us one of those specific Passover meals that Jesus had with his disciples just hours before he went to the cross in the upper room. And can you just imagine that scene? As Jesus is there in the upper room with his disciples, there's so many different things we could focus on, so many different images, right? The disciples arguing about who would be greatest. Jesus taking a towel and a basin and washing their feet. Judas getting up to go and betray Jesus. Jesus announcing that Peter would deny him three times, right? There's so many different things we could think about that were going on at this last Passover that Jesus would celebrate with his disciples. But let's set those images aside and let's focus in on what we're looking at today. And I want you to think about as Jesus took these cups, because Jesus, as the rabbi for these 12 men, he would have been leading the meal. And as he led it, he would talk about each of these cups. But you see, here's, here's what we need to understand. The Old Testament is not isolated from the New Testament. What we see in the Old Testament, we see Jesus in every page. He is the scarlet thread that weaves through the entire Bible. So in these cups of the Passover, we see Jesus. How do we see Jesus in the cup of sanctification? Just as the Lord, just as Yahweh led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery and out of bondage, so our Lord Jesus delivers us from the power of sin and death. You see, 
He led them to new life. He, he reminded them of the identity that they had. Jesus will lead us. John chapter 10 and verse three, the great I am statements. Jesus says, I am the door. And what does he say about himself? He says, I will lead my people. I will lead them out. They will follow me and I will lead them into pasture. It's the same idea. This cup of being set apart, this cup that reminds them that he will lead them out, that he gives them a new identity, that he changes them. Jesus, we see him in the cup of sanctification. We see Jesus in the cup of deliverance. Just as Yahweh delivered the Israelites from their Egyptian bondage, so Yahweh delivers us. Jesus delivers us from the condemnation that we stood behind. We were condemned. We were imprisoned. We were enslaved to sin. We deserve death, right? We were aliens. The Bible says even enemies of God but Jesus delivered us. Remember I said that this cup was sometimes called the cup of judgment because in order to deliver the people, he had to pour out his wrath through the plagues on the Egyptians. How did God deliver us? By pouring his wrath out on his own son to take our place so that we could be rescued, so that we could be set free from the enemy of our souls. But we see Jesus beautifully in the cup of redemption. Just as Yahweh redeemed, bought back Israel from Egypt through mighty acts of judgment, and remember, with outstretched arms. So our Lord Jesus, through outstretched arms that were nailed to a cross, through, through this mighty act of love where God demonstrated his love for us by putting the punishment that we deserved for sin upon his son, he bought us back. We deserve death. We were part of the kingdom of darkness the Bible says we were cut off. We were spiritually dead. We were enslaved. But God says, no, my son is gonna purchase your freedom through his outstretched arms on Calvary. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 says it this way. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And so it's right here that I want us to pause this morning because we have the opportunity today to come around the Lord's table for communion. And it's also here 2,000 years ago in an upper room where Jesus is partaking of the Passover for the last time with his disciples, where we read, and many times when we come to the Lord's table, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it says, Paul says, and, and I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord. And we say that we are to take his, we are to eat the bread because it represents his body, and we're to take the cup because it represents his blood, right? It's our instructions for this time of communion for this time of the Lord's Supper. But I want you to see something that maybe you've missed. Look at with me, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25. Look at what he says. It says, in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Which cup came after supper. It was the cup of redemption. So as Jesus going through the Passover gets to this cup of redemption, he says, this cup no longer symbolizes 
the blood of a lamb that was put on, applied to the doorpost of a home in order to purchase your freedom from Egypt. But from now on, when you see this cup of redemption, I want you to remember that this is my blood that needs to be applied to your heart in order for you to be redeemed from your sin and condemnation. This is the cup. Jesus took this cup, and he says it is this cup that when we come around the Lord's table, we're to remember. So I wanna invite you this morning. As you came in, you should have picked up the elements for communion. If you did not, that is okay. We have deacons who are moving around now in the aisles. Just slip up your hand if you did not get one of these as you came in, and they will make sure to place one of these in your hands. As they are doing that, let me remind you of a couple of things. Paul gives clear instructions about how we are to partake and come around the Lord's table. And the first of those instructions is this. This remembrance, this, this celebration, this, 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 this time is for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You see, the gift of salvation is available to anyone who would receive it. But coming around the Lord's table to remember his death and his sacrifice, this is for those who have done that. So if you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you are in the right place. We are so glad you are here today. But this is for those of us who have bowed a knee and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that's the first requirement to partake of communion. The second is this, that we would examine ourselves as believers, that we would pause and we would contemplate, right? The links that Jesus went to on our behalf to purchase our redemption, to atone for, to be our substitute, and that we would pause and, and that we would just take time to meditate on the great love that is represented by these elements and that we would examine our own hearts and that any sin that is there, right? Any, any, any attitude that just stands as an affront to the sacrifice of Jesus, that we would just confess that in this moment and say, God, examine my heart. Convict me of anything, any way that I am living that does not line up with my new identity as your child. God, I confess that to you. I repent of that. That's what it means to examine ourselves before we partake. So I'm gonna pause right now and give you a moment to just examine your hearts before we partake of this communion time. God, in this moment, we thank you for who you are, for what is attached to your name. God, that you sanctify us, that you deliver us. God, that you have redeemed us. And God, that you will gather us to yourself. God, may we live lives that ref reflect our gratitude for who you are and what you've done. God, may the way we live be a good representation of our new identity, not as those who are slaves to sin and to the world, but those who have been set free and adopted into your family as your children. So God, anything in our lives that does not glorify you, God, convict us in this moment now to confess that God, thank you for your word that says as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of any unrighteousness. We thank you as we come to your table now. We're reminded of your great love for us and we thank you for it. The Bible says that Jesus took bread at the Passover meal and he says, this bread represents my body that was broken for you. He says to take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Can we take the bread together? 
And as we just read a moment ago, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, and after supper, he took the cup, the cup of redemption. And he says, this is my blood. This represents my blood, the new covenant that I am initiating with my death, with my sacrifice, my death, my burial, my resurrection, this new covenant. This cup of redemption represents that. And he says, take it and drink it. And when you do, do it in remembrance of me. This is my blood that was shed for your redemption. Can we take the cup? Paul goes on to say, as often as we take the bread and we take the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, amen? What about the fourth cup? As we close this morning, what about this fourth cup? This cup of praise, this cup of gathering. Well, just as the Lord accomplished everything that was necessary to bring Israel to the promised land that he had promised to Abraham, so our Lord Jesus, through his death, his burial, and his resurrection has accomplished everything that is necessary to bring us to himself. You see, this cup is looking forward. The Israelites would have looked at this cup and they would, they would have just been in awe of what God had done to, to bring them to the promised land. We look at this cup, this cup of praise, this cup of gathering, and we realize that Christ has done that. John chapter 12 says, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. It's this idea of gathering. Ephesians chapter two, verse 13 says, it's because of the work of Christ that we who were once far off have been brought near. Right? It's through the gospel message. It's through the work of Jesus Christ, through his finished work, that we have been brought near, that we have been gathered to himself. We've been adopted into his family. Amen? But there's also a future fulfillment of this cup. You see, in Matthew 26, 29, when Jesus, after he's taken the cup of redemption, Right, he says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you when? When I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What cup is he talking about? He's talking about this last cup, this cup of praise, this cup of gathering, this Hallel cup. He says, listen, I didn't just come and die on the cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins, so that you could be redeemed. But there is a future hope of our salvation when we will be glorified, when we will spend eternity with him in his presence. Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. And he says, I'm gonna come again and receive you to myself to gather you. That's this cup. And Jesus says, I'm not gonna drink this cup yet. I'm gonna drink this cup with you in my father's house. Revelation Chapter 19 and verse nine, it's this picture of the marriage supper of the lamb where all those who have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb gather around the table for this feast where Jesus, our bridegroom, is there with us, his bride, who have been washed white by his blood. We've been clean. And he says he will gather us and we will celebrate together together before him, that's this idea. And Jesus says, that's what we have to look forward to, church. That is the hope of our salvation. Isn't that such an awesome thought? To know that there is coming a day for, where those of us who know Jesus as Savior will be gathered together for all of eternity, face to face with the Lamb of God gathered together with people from every tribe and tongue and nation, with all of the saints that have gone before us through all the ages, we will be gathered together to do what? To say hallelujah to the lamb who was slain. This cup of praise, 
What a savior, amen? What a redeemer. What a savior, what a redeemer. He is all of this, right? This is the gospel message that we've looked at even in the book of Exodus today. We've seen the gospel, right? Because all of scripture breathes the name of Jesus. He was the cloud and he was the fire that went before the people and led them out. He was their sanctification. He's our sanctification. Jesus is the better Moses who didn't just deliver people from Egypt, but he delivered us from the power of sin and death. Jesus is our true kinsman redeemer who saw us in our weakness and said, I will pay their debt so that they can be set free. And Jesus is the object of our praise because he is the one who is preparing a place for us to spend all eternity with himself. Hallelujah. 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 So we are gonna do what is only natural to do in this moment, and that is to respond to this beautiful message of the gospel that we've seen today through these cups, and we're gonna sing praise our praise team is gonna come and we're gonna sing a final song of worship this morning. You know, maybe you're here today and you are what scripture would describe as dead in your sin. The message of the gospel that we have seen even through these four cups today is clear. Today can be the day of salvation for you, just as in Egypt, in order to be rescued, in order to be redeemed, the blood of a spotless lamb had to be applied to the doorpost of their home. Can I tell you today, if you have never bowed a knee to Jesus, that even though everything that was necessary to accomplish your salvation was done by Jesus 2,000 years ago, until you apply the blood of the lamb to your heart, you are separated from him. So is today the day that you are ready to acknowledge your sin and confess that Jesus Christ is your only hope of salvation? And are you ready to respond today to the gospel and give your life to Jesus? If so, in just a minute, when we sing, I would invite you to come. Maybe today you're here as a believer and maybe today you just need to just respond in praise because of the beauty of our Savior, because of what he has done for you. Maybe you just need to stand and you need to sing like you've never sung before. Maybe there's another act of worship. Maybe you need to respond. Maybe there's an area of obedience, right, that you've been resisting and you just need to even use these steps as an altar this morning and say, God, I'm laying it down. I'm not running. I'm, I'm willing. If you would go to these links to save me, God, my life is yours, so use me. I will obey. Here I am. I cannot tell you how to respond. I can just say if the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart, you must respond today. What a Savior. What a redeemer, our sanctification, our deliverance, our redemption, and the one who we praise because we know that he will gather us to himself one day and we can sing in hope for that day that is to come, amen.